Hey everyone, good to see you back for the continuation of our physical chemistry lecture series. So in this video, we'll just continue from where we left off with equilibrium. And this time, we'll finally start looking at chemical reactions that can occur in our thermodynamic system. Okay, so here's just an outline of our discussion in this video. So first off, we'll look more closely at the thermodynamics of multi-component systems. Okay, so we'll introduce an important thermodynamic parameter called partial molar quantities. And we'll also look at how we can determine extensive properties such as Gibbs free energy for multi-component systems using those partial molar quantities. Okay, so first we'll deal with ideal systems, then with non-ideal systems. So in discussing deviation from ideal behavior will also introduce additional terms like fugacity and activity. So overall, our initial introductory discussion on the thermodynamics of multi-component systems will allow us to derive an equation that will be very, very useful for us when we consider chemical equilibrium. It will also lead us to the concept of the equilibrium constant, which helps us predict properties and changes in chemical equilibrium systems. Okay, so mostly we'll be talking about ideal systems, but in the latter part of our discussion, we'll discuss non-ideal systems, particularly systems involving ionic equilibria. Okay, so to start off, we know that chemical reactions involve the transformation of one or more chemical species, the reactants, to form new chemical species, the products. Okay, So overall, in chemical reactions, we typically have to deal with more than one chemical species in our system, so the system will ultimately be a mixture. So we can describe this multi-component system with extensive properties that will be dependent on convenient independent variables like temperature and pressure. Okay, So of course, it'll also be dependent on the number of moles of each component in the system, okay? So say that we have some extensive property x. So x is a function of temperature, pressure, and the number of moles of each component in the system. So for simplicity, let's just say that we have components 1 and components 2. Okay, so if we want to get the overall expression for how x changes with all of its independent variables, we can write the total differential, okay? So this is going to be dx is equal to partial of x with respect to t at constant pressure and number of moles of the components times dt plus partial of x with respect to p at constant temperature and number of moles of the components times dp plus partial of x with respect to number of moles of component 1 at constant temperature and pressure, and component 2 times dn2, plus partial of x with respect to number of moles of component 2 at constant temperature, pressure, and number of moles of component 1 times dn2. Okay, so note this time, of course, that when we're dealing with multi-component systems, we have to consider these particular partial derivatives, okay? So these partial derivatives tells us the dependence of the extensive property on the molar composition of the system, okay? So these partial derivatives are called your partial molar quantities, Okay, so overall partial molar quantities, they indicate how an extensive property of a multi-component system varies with changes in the system's molar composition at constant temperature and pressure. Okay, so the general expression for a partial molar quantity for some extensive property x for component i is just the change in x with respect to the number of moles of component i while temperature, pressure, and all other components remain constant. Okay, so the notation that we can use to represent a partial molar quantity is just to add a bar on top of our symbol for the extensive property. Okay, so an additional note about partial molar quantities is that they are intensive properties. So they will be dependent only on the composition of the system and not the size. So now that we have defined partial molar quantities, so the next question is, of course, so why do we need to consider them in the first place? Okay? So partial molar quantities are important because we use them to determine the extensive property of the whole system. Okay? It's very important to note that extensive properties for multi-component systems are not simply additive. Okay? The components in our system will inevitably interact with one another. Okay? So a very tangible example for this principle is when we consider 
partial molar volumes, okay? So from experience, you probably know that volumes are not additive. So when we try to mix together, say, 50 ml of ethanol and 50 ml of water, the total volume will not be 100 ml. Okay, so this is due to the fact that ethanol and water will be interacting with one another. So when we form a mixture, the ethanol and water molecules will interact in a way that will be different than if we had the pure components separately. So it's possible that the molecules in the mixture can allow more or less space in between the molecules. So this will manifest in a different volume for the mixture. Okay, so the partial molar quantities pretty much tell us how these two components will contribute to the total extensive property of the system when they interact to form a system together. Okay, so also note that these interactions will be unique based on what components are in the system. So we also expect that the partial molar quantity of one component will be dependent on the other components in the system. Okay, so in this water ethanol system, for example, the partial molar volume of water is written as, okay, so we have V bar for water. This is equal to partial of V with respect to the number of moles of water at constant temperature pressure and number of moles of ethanol in the system. Okay, so this quantity is unique for water's interaction with ethanol okay so if water formed a system with another compound like acetone the partial molar volume of water will be different for that water acetone system because the nature of the interactions between the components are going to be different in each case okay so if we know what the partial molar quantities are how can we get the total extensive property Okay, so we can do that by using the summation rule for solutions. Okay, so this is a summation rule over here. So this is a general rule for extensive properties in multi-component systems. Okay, so this says that we can get the total extensive property of a multi-component system by multiplying the partial molar quantity of a component by the number of moles of that component and then summing all of that up for each of the components. Okay. So for the total volume in the ethanol water system, okay, so we could express volume as just the partial molar volume of water times the number of moles of water in the system plus the partial molar volume of ethanol times the number of moles of ethanol in the system. Okay, so we can also apply the summation rule for an important extensive property that we usually consider for systems, which is the Gibbs free energy. Okay, so in order to get the total Gibbs free energy of a multi component system, we have G for the system. This is just going to be equal to the summation of the partial molar Gibbs for component I times the number of moles of component I. Okay, so this is summed all over all of the components in the system, okay? So we could also investigate this partial molar Gibbs more closely, okay? So we know that partial molar Gibbs of component I can be expressed as partial of G with respect to the number of moles of component I, all at constant temperature, pressure, and constant number of moles of the other components in the system. Okay, so actually the partial molar Gibbs is such an important quantity that we give it its own name and symbol. So this here, this is the chemical potential of component I. Okay, so note for pure one component systems, the chemical potential is just molar Gibbs free energy. Okay, but for multi-component systems, our chemical potential is partial molar Gibbs free energy. Okay? okay, so this ultimately tells us the contribution of each component to the total free energy of the system when we have a mixture. Okay, so recall again that chemical potential is important because we saw before that it is the differences in chemical potential that drives processes with changes in the amounts of substances like chemical reactions. Okay, so we can use chemical potential as a basis to determine the chemical reactions in a system. Okay, so the challenge is now to determine the partial molar Gibbs free energy or the chemical potential of a component when we have it in a multi-component system. Okay, so we can do this by starting with a reference state and bringing our component to the state where it is in a mixture. Okay, so our reference state will be the chemical potential of the component in its pure state. Okay, so this is mu i naught. 
Okay, so for gases, the standard state recall is one atmosphere or in some references, one bar. Okay, so we'll indicate the standard state of our pure substance as P naught. Okay, so what we'll be doing is that we'll be bringing our gaseous component from its pure state all the way to when it's in its mixture at the partial pressure of Pi. So in the mixture, it will have a corresponding chemical potential, mu, okay, which is what we want to find. Okay, so as our gas is undergoing this process, this recall the expression relating changes to mu with changes in temperature and pressure. Okay, so this is d mu, so let's indicate this is for component I. This is equal to negative SDT plus VDP. Okay, so again, this is our molar entropy and this is our molar volume. Okay, so for our particular process, we'll be considering it at constant temperature. Okay, so dt becomes zero. So this means we'll be looking at d mu i is equal to v i d p. Okay, so in our first consideration of this, let's consider an ideal gas. Okay, so recall again that this part over here, this refers to our molar volume. Okay, so for an ideal gas, we know that we have the relationship of PV is equal to nRT. So that means our molar volume is just going to be equal to RT over PI. Okay, so PI, this is going to be our partial pressure of our gaseous component I. Okay, so again, we'll be, we'll be taking our gas through this process over here. Okay, so we'll be bringing it from its pure state all the way to when it's in a mixture. Okay, so we'll be establishing our limits of integration over here. For the left side here is when we start from the pure state. Okay, so this is our chemical potential in the pure state all the way to when it is in the mixture. Okay, so... The complementary limits for the right side of the equation is going to be the standard pressure state, okay, so that is one atmosphere or one bar, all the way to when we are in the mixture, okay, so this is the partial pressure of the gas when it's in the mixture, okay. So upon integrating, we get mu i, okay, so the chemical potential of our component i in the mixture minus the pure chemical potential, this is equal to p naught to pi okay so we need to make sure that we replace our expression for our molar volume over here so we have rt over pi times dp okay so if we integrate this expression over here this will be equal to rt ln pi over pi naught okay so let's rewrite our expression okay so let's just move on to a fresh slide over here okay so the chemical potential of component I, if we treat it as an ideal gas, this is going to be equal to, so let's move the pure chemical potential on the other side, plus RT ln, the partial pressure of component I, over the standard pressure. Okay, so this is our expression for the chemical potential of I when it is in a mixture. with partial pressure pi okay so this is calculated using a reference state so this is our standard chemical potential which refers to the chemical potential of our pure substance in the standard state Okay, and that standard state refers to this over here. Okay, so since we're dealing with a gas in this particular case, the standard state is when we have one atmosphere. Okay, so overall this equation gives us a way to calculate the chemical potential of a component in a mixture. Okay, so note again that this equation, this involves ideal gases. Okay, so we could adapt this equation for other cases, okay, so we could adapt it for real gases or for e even for other cases just by modifying the equation a little bit, okay, so for real gases, we could just add a corrective term in order to account for real gas behavior, okay, so for real gases, we'll be introducing a new term over here, we'll be using the term fugacity, 
Okay, so fugacity, this is just a fancy term that refers to the real pressure exerted by a gas. Okay, so fugacity is just given the symbol of F. Okay, so the fugacity of component I is just equal to the ideal gas pressure times some corrective term. Okay, so again, this is just the ideal gas pressure. And our term over here, this is just the fugacity coefficient. Okay, so our fugacity coefficient, this again is our corrective term that accounts for departures in ideality. Okay, so note guys, recall again when a real gas approaches ideal gas behavior. Okay, so that is typically when our pressures approach zero okay so when our pressures are very very close to zero this implies that our fugacity approaches our ideal gas pressure okay so this implies that our coefficient approaches one okay note however that our fugacity coefficient can be less than or greater than one in order to account for positive or negative deviations from ideal gas behavior Okay, so we could introduce our fugacity term into our original expression in order to adjust it for real gas behavior. Okay, so recall again that for our ideal expression, okay, so the chemical potential of component I when it behaves ideally is just equal to the chemical potential of the pure component plus RT ln ideal gas pressure over PI naught. Okay, so when we adapt this for real gas behavior, okay, so we could expect that the, the chemical potential of component I when it behaves like a real gas is just equal to the pure chemical potential plus RT ln fugacity over the standard pressure. Okay, so this can also be rewritten as mu I naught plus RT ln fugacity coefficient times pi over pi naught. Okay, so again for real gases we just introduced a corrective term in order to account for deviations from ideal behavior. Okay, so we could also expand the expression that we just derived for other systems. Okay, so not only for gaseous systems but also for solutions and also for condensed phase components. Okay, so we'll also introduce another more general term. Okay, so we'll be introducing the term activity. Okay, so we'll be using activity to denote the so called effective concentration or pressure of a substance relative to the standard state. Okay, so we'll generalize the expression that we derive for our ideal gas system. Okay, so overall the chemical potential of I, this will be equal to the chemical potential of the pure component plus RT ln times the activity of component I. Okay, so this very general expression over here, okay, so this was adapted from the expression derived from the ideal gas equation, okay, and generalized towards all other systems, okay. So for gases, we could expand what activity means exactly, okay, so the activity of component I, this is just equal to the fugacity of component I over the standard pressure, okay? So expanding this, this is just equal to the fugacity coefficient of I times the pressure of I over the standard pressure. Or we could also express this as more generally as the activity coefficient of I times the pressure of I over the standard pressure. Okay, so this over here, gamma, this is called our activity coefficient. Okay, so our activity coefficient, it's kind of like our fugacity coefficient, but it's a more general expression for deviations from ideality. Okay, so it could apply for gases, it could also apply for other types of components. So we could also apply the expression of activity for solutes. Okay? So later on we'll be dealing a lot with equilibrium in aqueous solutions. Okay? So we could express our activity as the activity coefficient of I times the concentration 
of I over the standard state concentration. So again, this is our activity coefficient, which takes into account deviations from ideality. Okay, so again, since we're dealing with solutes, the more convenient way to express the amount of a solute is in terms of concentration. Okay, and we also have, similar to our standard pressure, we also have a standard state for solutes in aqueous solution, and our standard state for that is equal to one molar. So just for emphasis for gases, our standard state is one atmosphere. Okay, so since we're dividing the corresponding pressures or concentrations by the standard state, okay, this means that our activity is expected to be unitless. Okay, so in order to make sure that this is unitless, that means the units for pressure up here and the units for concentration up here have to be consistent with the standard state units okay so that means we have to express our pressure up here in terms of atmosphere and our concentration up here in terms of molarity okay so again always keep in mind that our activity this is the effective concentration or pressure of a substance relative to the standard state okay so that means we are always dividing the corresponding pressures or concentrations by the standard state Okay, so we could also apply activity for condensed phases such as solids and liquids. But for the most part, we consider the activities of these pure solids and liquids to just be equal to 1. Okay, so overall now that we're familiar with determining the activities for different types of components that we might see in our system, we can now put together all the expressions that we've just discussed in order to determine the Gibbs-free energy change of a system that undergoes a chemical reaction. Okay, so let's just start with a general chemical reaction over here. So we have A and B reacting to form C and D. Okay, so note that this reaction doesn't have to go to completion in our system. Okay, so overall we could start by writing the expression for the Gibbs free energy change for this reaction. So that is just delta G is equal to the Gibbs free energy of our products minus the Gibbs free energy of our reactants. Okay, so next we just need to determine how we could express the absolute Gibbs free energy of the products as well as the reactants. Okay, so note that the products they're made out of two components and the reactants are also made up of two components. So this is pretty much a multi-component system. Okay, so from our previous discussion, we were able to get an expression that tells us the total Gibbs free energy of a multi-component system, and that is given by the summation rule. Okay, so we can apply our summation rule for our products as well as our reactants. Okay, so all we need to do is to multiply the corresponding chemical potential of each component and multiply that by the number of moles of that component. Okay, so let's just write that down over here. Okay, so we have the summation rule applied for our products and the summation rule applied for our reactants. Okay, so we also got an expression that allowed us to determine the chemical potential of a component based on a reference state. Okay, and that reference state is the pure chemical potential of that component. Okay, so that general equation is given by the chemical potential of the pure component plus RT times LN of the activity of that component in the mixture. Okay, so let's just apply this equation for each of these components over here. So overall we have delta G is equal to C times our expression for the chemical potential of C plus D times the expression for the chemical potential of D minus the quantity A times the chemical potential of A expression plus B times the chemical potential of B expression. Okay, so we could distribute our stoichiometric coefficients into each of our expressions, and we could also group together several terms. Okay, so note that we have two types of terms over here. We have the chemical potential of our pure components plus the RTLN activity component. Okay, so let's just expand our expression and then group together some terms. Okay, so over here we group together our pure chemical potential terms, and we also have our terms over here that include our RTLN activity terms, okay? So we could do additional manipulations for these terms down here, okay? So we could bring this coefficient 
inside the natural logarithm term over here and introduce it as an exponent for the activity terms, okay? So we'll be doing that for each of these four terms down here, okay? So as for this term over here, the term that includes the chemical potentials of our pure components, we could actually equate this to another term, okay? So let's just focus on this part over here, okay? So we could rewrite this group of terms over here in red as the standard Gibbs free energy change of the process, okay? So delta G naught, that is just G naught of the products minus G naught of the reactants, okay? So again, we could also apply the summation rule for these two terms over here, and that will just be the pure chemical potential of each component times the corresponding number of moles, okay? So this expression over here is equivalent to this expression okay so we could replace this whole expression with delta g naught okay so also note that we did some manipulations on our second term over here okay so we just brought in the stoichiometric coefficient as an exponent of our natural logarithm term inside okay so making the corresponding replacements okay so we replaced our term here in red with delta g naught and we could also simplify our natural logarithm term over here so we could just apply the rules of logarithms and ultimately we have our expression over here okay so delta g is equal to delta g naught plus rt ln of the activities of the products raised to the corresponding stoichiometric coefficients over the activities of the reactants, each raised to their corresponding stoichiometric coefficients. So this expression is probably very familiar to you guys at this point, right? We could also allow our collection of activity terms to be equal to QA, okay? So QA, this is our reaction quotient in terms of activities, okay? So we could finally rewrite our expression as delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT ln QA. Okay, so overall this expression just tells us the Gibbs free energy change for a system with reacting components. Okay, so our reacting components, the amounts of each of those components are in the ratio QA, which is our reaction quotient. Okay, so just to emphasize what each part of this expression means, okay, so our delta G naught, okay, so this is the Gibbs free energy change, the standard Gibbs free energy change observed if we have A moles of A and B moles of B in the standard state reacting to form C moles of C and D moles of D also in their standard states. So our delta G naught, this just serves as sort of a standardized arbitrary starting point or reference point in order to calculate the Gibbs free energy change for the process. Okay, so recall again the Gibbs free energy, this is a state function. So the pathway in which the process occurs does not matter, but the only thing that really matters is the final and the initial states. Okay, so it's also important to note that Gibbs free energy change does not have a zero point such as our entropy, so that's why we have to establish an arbitrary reference point which we establish as a standard state for our components game okay? so as for this second term over here our RTL and QA okay so this term takes into account the actual amounts of the reactant end product on the total free energy of the system so this term here our reaction quotient this takes into account the actual amounts of our components in the system at any moment, okay? So it doesn't have to be in equilibrium. We can, however, develop an expression that will allow us to determine what happens at equilibrium exactly. So at equilibrium, we know that our delta G, based on our discussion on the criteria for equilibrium, our delta G has to be equal to zero, okay? So when our system that contains a chemical reaction is at equilibrium, our components are also going to have a very specific ratio, okay? At, so at equilibrium, we could equate our reaction quotient to a very specific ratio, okay? So this ratio tells us the activities of our products and our reactants at equilibrium, okay? So this is our equilibrium constant, okay? So we could take into account 
these conditions for equilibrium into our initial equation for Gibbs free energy. Okay, so we could set delta G as equal to zero and our reaction quotient as equal to the equilibrium constant. Okay, so setting this to zero and our QA as our KA, we could get an expression for our equilibrium constant as well as our delta G naught. Okay, so just rearranging this, we could say that delta G naught, this is equal to negative RT ln KA. So you might be thinking that it's kind of weird that our equilibrium constant is determined by using the standard Gibbs free energy change. But keep in mind that Ka, this is in terms of activities, right? And each activity term is determined with respect to our reference state. Okay, So recall again that an activity term for a component I, so for a gaseous state, this is the pressure exerted by I in the equilibrium state over the standard pressure. Okay, So actually all of our activities and ultimately our equilibrium constant is measured against our standard state. So our equilibrium constant gives us an idea of how our reaction proceeds if we started from a standard reference point, which is our standard state, okay? So we could also rearrange this expression to get an expression for our equilibrium constant in terms of delta G naught. So that is just Ka is equal to exponential of negative delta G naught over RT. Okay, so we could actually compare the values of the reaction quotient and the Ka in order to help us determine which direction the reaction will occur. Okay, so this will really help us later on once you start looking at factors that affect equilibrium. Okay, so again, let's just start with our original equation. Okay, so we have delta G is equal to delta G naught plus RT ln QA. Okay, so we could use the expression that we got earlier for delta G naught. Okay, so we could replace this with negative RT ln QA. Ka. Okay, so since these are very common terms, we could combine them. Okay, so we have delta G is equal to RT ln reaction quotient over equilibrium constant. So we could determine the direction of the process based on this ratio. Okay, so recall again that if our delta G is less than zero, this means that we tend to have a process that proceeds in the forward direction, right? Okay, so we have a spontaneous process. So if we have delta G less than zero, this implies that our quantity L and QA over KA is also going to be less than zero. So this tells us something about the values of QA and KA. Okay, so in order for our ln natural logarithm expression to be less than zero, this means that QA has to be less than KA. Okay, so if ever our reaction quotient is less than the equilibrium constant, we have a forward direction favored. Okay, so on the other hand, if our delta G is greater than zero, okay, this implies that our natural logarithm expression has to be greater than zero as well. Okay, so this implies that the QA is greater than the KA. So this implies that we have too many products in the system compared to that which is expected at equilibrium. So the tendency is that the reaction will proceed backwards. Okay, So in the final case, when delta G is equal to zero, this means that our natural logarithm expression has to be equal to zero as well. So this only happens when our expression over here, QA over KA, is equal to one. So this implies that, of course, QA is equal to KA. Okay, So this is the case when we have equilibrium established, okay? and neither direction is favored in this case. All right, okay, so we'll be going back to a consideration of reaction quotient and equilibrium constant once we'll, once we'll be looking at the factors affecting equilibrium, okay? But before we proceed to that, let's consider how we could determine an expression for the equilibrium constant for different types of cases and also how we could determine it from different types of problems, okay? So let's proceed with determining the equilibrium constant expression for different types of systems. So first, let's consider this gas system. System, okay, so know that all of the components in our system are gases. Okay, so first off, we could start by writing out the Ka expression or the equilibrium constant in terms of activities. So Ka, this is going to be the activity of the product, NO2, over the activity of nitrogen gas raised to its stoichiometric coefficient, which is half, times the activity of oxygen gas. 
So we could so note earlier that we could expand the expression for activity for a gas by writing it as the partial pressure of the gas over the standard pressure times any correction factors. Okay? So overall, we could write our equilibrium constant expression as activity coefficient of each of our components times the partial pressure of the component over the standard pressure. Okay? So just recall that the standard pressure is established as one atmosphere. Okay? So we could also split off this expression. Okay? So we could collect terms over here. We could collect our activity coefficient terms, and we could also collect our corresponding pressure terms. Okay? So we could rewrite our Ka expression as the collection of activity coefficient terms and the collection of pressure terms. Okay? So we could designate this expression over here as k gamma, okay? So we could also rewrite this whole expression as kp, okay? So kp, this is just our equilibrium constant expressed in terms of pressures, okay? And our k gamma, this is our collection of terms for our activity coefficients, okay? So overall, our Kp, this is the equilibrium constant if our gas behaved ideally, okay? If we have ideal behavior, recall, our gamma, our activity coefficient, is going to be approaching 1, okay? So this implies that our K gamma, this is going to be approaching 1 as well, okay? So for ideal behavior, our Ka can be approximated by our K. P, okay, so for much of our discussion, we'll be assuming ideal behavior, so we could express our equilibrium constant in terms of pressures instead for gaseous systems, okay? So again, for ideal gas systems, we could also write it in another way, okay? So note again that for ideal gases, our Ka can be approximated by Kp, Okay, but again, since we're dealing with ideal gases, that means that our expression PV is equal to nRT, the ideal gas equation, is going to apply. Okay, so we could rewrite the partial pressures of each of the gases in terms of P is equal to nRT over V. Okay, so if we divide the number of moles by volume, this gives us a concentration term, right? So this is P is equal to CRT, where C is the concentration of the gas in terms of moles per liter or just molarity, okay? So let's replace each of the partial pressure terms over here with the concentration times RT term, okay? So this means that we'll be having concentration of NO2 times RT over the corresponding standard pressure divided by the concentration of nitrogen gas times RT over the standard pressure raised to half times the concentration of oxygen gas times RT over the standard pressure. So very similar to what we did earlier, we could also collect different terms over here. Okay, so we could collect all the concentration terms into this expression over here. Okay, so an additional note, guys, is that this collection of terms that we left behind, this is just a constant, right? So R is a constant and temperature, so the temperature conditions are constant and the corresponding Standard pressure is also a constant, okay? So we could also express our concentration of each component at equilibrium as another type of equilibrium constant, okay? So we're going to call this collection of terms our Kc. So Kc is just our equilibrium constant of a gaseous system expressed in terms of concentration, okay? So that is in terms of molarity, all right. So an additional thing, guys, is that we just collected these terms over here. Okay. So we'll be combining the exponents. So that is one minus half minus one. Okay. So this is pretty much, if you want to generalize this, this is just the change in number of moles of gases in our balanced chemical equation. Okay. So our general expression for when we want to interconvert between different types of equilibrium constant expressions, so we just have Kp, which is our equilibrium constant of a gaseous system expressed in terms of partial pressures. This is equal to Kc, our equilibrium expressed in terms of gaseous concentration, times Rt over the standard pressure, all raised to 
the change in number of moles of gas in our balanced chemical equation. Okay, so additional notes here, guys, is that Kp, this is expected to be unitless. Okay, so note from our original expression in Kp, all of our partial pressures are divided by the standard pressure. Okay, so we have atmosphere, 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 atmosphere. So all of the pressure units are canceled out by virtue of dividing it by the standard state. Okay, so in our derivation, the standard state is carried over to our RT term over here. Okay, so that means that over here in our KC expression, we have molarity over molarity raised to half times molarity. Okay, so that means this KC expression might not be unitless. Okay, in our particular example, our KC expression here, this is expected to have the units of 1 over molarity raised to half, whereas over here we have R, which is which has the units of liters atmosphere per mole kel Kelvin times Kelvin over pressure. Okay, so that is atmosphere. So ultimately, our units for this is moles raised to half. Okay, so when we multiply these two things together, the units cancel out. Okay, so just a word of warning in terms of how we convert between Kp and Kc. Okay. So just be just also be very careful about the types of units that we use for our RT over the standard pressure expression over here. So overall, this is for gaseous systems, okay? So let's move on to cases in which we'll be dealing with solution systems, okay? So we have solutes as our components, okay? So over here, our example system is dealing with the reaction of acetic acid in water, okay? So we have the dissociation of acetic acid to form our hydronium ions and our acetate ions, okay? So we could write down the general expression for the equilibrium constant in terms of activities. So Ka, this is going to be the activity of our hydronium ion times the activity of our acetate ion over the activity of our acetic acid times the activity of our water, okay? So an additional note here, guys, is that since we're, we're dealing with a solvent over here, the activity of our condensed phase component, this is expected to be just equal to 1. Okay, So we could expand the remaining terms over here into their corresponding activity expressions. Okay? So since we're dealing with a solute system, okay, so we'll be expressing that in terms of molar concentration divided by their corresponding standard state, which is one molar. And we also introduce the corrective term over here, the activity coefficient for each of the terms. Okay, so similar to what we did with our gaseous system, we could also collect terms. Okay, so we could collect our activity coefficient terms and separate this out from our from our concentration terms. Okay, so again, we could express our activity coefficient terms as k gamma, okay, and and we also have our equilibrium constant expression in terms of concentration terms. Okay, so in our particular case, we'll just call it Keq prime to distinguish it from Kc. Okay, so this is very important to note, guys, is that if we're dealing with solution systems, we can't interconvert this to Kb. So it's very, very tempting to say that this expression here, since we're since we express our equilibrium constant in terms of concentration, that this is equivalent to Kc as we derived earlier, which can be interconverted to Kb. So this is not the case. Okay. So our Kc expression that we derived earlier that refers to concentration of gaseous components. Okay. So if we're dealing with an aqueous solution system over here, it doesn't make sense to convert our equilibrium constant that's expressed in terms of concentrations into a Kp expression. Okay. So just be very wary about the true meaning of what Kp and Kc means from our earlier discussion. Okay, so that's why I'm using a new term over here, Keq prime, instead to distinguish this from the Kc of our gaseous system. Okay, so again, if we're dealing with an ideal solution, okay, so note that if we're dealing with, with liquid solutions, an ideal solution is one that is very, very dilute. Okay, so if we have an ideal solution, this means that the activity coefficients, they're pretty much approaching 
one. So this implies that our k gamma is just approaching one. So that means that our k a can be approximated by our k e q prime. Okay. So for solutions, we could express our equilibrium constant just in terms of concentration terms. So this is for solution systems. Okay, so now let's look at one final case in which we're dealing with a mixed system. Okay, so in our mixed system, we have carbon dioxide gas reacting with water to form aqueous carbonic acid okay so each of our components in our system is a completely different type of component okay so we have a solid component we have a pure we have a condensed phase component here and we also have a gaseous component overall however we could write a general expression for the equilibrium constant in terms of activities okay so that is ka is equal to the activity of our carbonic acid over the activity of carbon dioxide times the activity of water okay so since of course water is a condensed phase component we could just express the activity as one Okay, so our Ka can just be in terms of the activity of our carbonic acid and the activity of our carbon dioxide gas. Okay, so if we're going to expand these activity terms, okay, we could express the activity of carbonic acid as the molar concentration of our carbonic acid divided by the corresponding standard state and multiplied by the corresponding activity coefficient. So our activity of carbon dioxide, on the other hand, is in terms of the partial pressure of carbon dioxide divided by the standard pressure times the corresponding activity coefficient. Okay, so again, similar to our earlier treatment, we could collect the activity coefficient terms, okay, and we could express it as K gamma, okay? So if we have this mixed expression over here, we could just express that as KEQ prime, okay? So that is just the collection of concentration or pressure terms of the reactants and products without the corresponding activity coefficients, okay? So again, note that our equilibrium constants, they're always going to be unitless because we always divide each of the corresponding reactants or products by their corresponding standard state. So if it's in terms of a solid concentration, we divide it by the standard state of one molar. And if it's in terms of a partial pressure, we always divide it by the corresponding standard pressure, which is one atmosphere. So again, if we have an ideal system, our K gamma is just approaching 1. So that means we could express our Ka as our KEQ prime. Okay? So overall, now that we're familiar with determining the equilibrium constant expressions for different types of systems, let's look more closely at the different properties of the equilibrium constant. So for illustrative purposes, we'll be using the same reaction that we started with for our gaseous system. So here we have the corresponding equilibrium constant expression in terms of activities. So the first property is that if we reverse the equation, this will ultimately invert our equilibrium constant, okay? So if we write down the Ka expression for our reversed equation, this is going to be the activity of nitrogen gas raised to half times the activity of oxygen over the activity of NO2. Okay, so this is just equal to the inverse of our original equilibrium constant expression over here. Okay, so our next property is that if we multiply the equation by a certain coefficient, this is going to raise the equilibrium constant by n. Okay, so if we're going to write the equilibrium constant expression for this expression here, okay, this is going to be the activity of NO2 raised to 2 times the activity of N2 times the activity of oxygen raised to 2. Okay, so since what we did here is that we multiplied this entire expression by 2, Okay, this means that we have to raise our original equilibrium constant by 2. Okay, so this here, this is just equal to Ka squared. Okay, and lastly, the final property is when we start adding reactions. Okay, so if we're applying Hess's law to our reaction over here, okay, so say that we want to add this particular reaction over here with its corresponding Ka expression, and we want to get the Ka expression for the summed reaction, the final K expression, this is expected to be the activity of carbon times the activity of NO2 
over the activity of nitrogen gas raised to half times the activity of CO2. Okay, so this is actually just Ka1 times Ka2. Okay, so you can see here that if we multiply these two things together, the oxygen, the activity of oxygen cancels out and we end up with an expression that is equivalent to this over here. Okay, so just be aware about the different properties of the equilibrium constant when we're doing manipulations on our original equation. Okay, so finally we could also look at how we could determine the equilibrium constant. Okay, so there's many different ways in which we could determine the equilibrium constant. So that can be from the corresponding equilibrium composition or measuring changes in pressure or concentration or from the corresponding degree of dissociation. Okay, so there's many different ways in which we can determine the equilibrium constant. So for illustrative purposes, we'll be looking at these different ways by solving different types of problems. Okay, so for our first problem, we'll be solving for the equilibrium constant from the equilibrium composition. Okay, so in this particular example, we'll just be solving for Kp. So we're going to be assuming that we have ideal gas behavior for our entire system. Okay, so overall in this problem, we're at constant temperature. Okay, so we know that we start with a reaction of one part nitrogen with three parts of hydrogen gas. And we end up with an equilibrium composition that contains 20% mole ammonia at a total pressure of 10 atmospheres, okay? So overall, our strategy for this will be the standard strategy for solving equilibrium problems. So we'll be using our initial change and equilibrium tables or ice tables that correspond to the changes in pressure or number of moles of each of our components from the initial to the final equilibrium state. Okay, so in this particular case, let's allow our amounts of each component to be expressed in the partial pressures, okay? So initially, we know that we start with one part nitrogen and three parts hydrogen, okay? So we don't really know the exact amounts involved, but we could just express the amount of nitrogen as I, and we know that we have three times that for hydrogen, okay? So 3i, okay? So one part nitrogen, three parts hydrogen, okay? So we also know that we start with no ammonia in our initial state. Okay, so we could determine the equilibrium composition by considering the corresponding stoichiometric changes as the reaction proceeds to equilibrium. So the corresponding change for nitrogen gas is going to be minus x. Okay, the change for hydrogen gas is going to be minus 3x and our ammonia increases by 2x. So the cha corresponding changes are going to be stoichiometric in nature. Okay, so if we consider the total equilibrium amounts then, so we have I minus X for nitrogen. For hydrogen, on the other hand, we have 3I minus 3X. And for ammonia, we have 2X. Okay, so these quantities here correspond to the partial pressures of our system at equilibrium. Okay, so an additional note over here that for hydrogen, we could express this as 3i minus x. Okay, so if we note here that i minus x is corresponds to the partial pressure of nitrogen. Okay, so that means we could express the partial pressure of hydrogen in terms of that of nitrogen. Okay, so overall note here that if we start with the corresponding stoichiometric amount of nitrogen and hydrogen, so 1 is to 3, we end up with a ratio of 1 is to 3 at equilibrium as well, okay? Okay, so overall we could express the partial pressure of hydrogen as 3 times the partial pressure of nitrogen, okay? So 3 times partial pressure of nitrogen, okay? So at least over here we established a relationship between the equilibrium partial pressures, okay? Okay, so we'll see that when we write out the Kp that we need to determine the partial pressure of ammonia, the partial pressure of hydrogen and nitrogen at equilibrium to calculate the Kp. Okay, so our expression for Kp, this is just the partial pressure of ammonia at equilibrium divided by the corresponding standard pressure raised to 2 divided by the partial pressure of nitrogen gas divided by the standard pressure times the partial pressure of hydrogen gas over the standard pressure raised to 3. Okay, so based on our problem, we know that we end up with 20% mole ammonia at a total pressure of 10 atmospheres. Okay, so we know that Pt, this is equal to 10 atmospheres. Okay, so our total pressure, this is equal to the partial pressure of ammonia 
at the equilibrium plus the partial pressure of nitrogen gas plus the partial pressure of hydrogen gas. Okay, so from our given, we actually could solve for the partial pressure of ammonia at equilibrium because we know that we end up with 20% mole ammonia, okay? So the partial pressure of ammonia, this is expressed as mole fraction of ammonia in the mixture times the total pressure, okay? So this is just equal to 0 0.2 or 0 0.20 times 10 atmospheres. So that means that the partial pressure of ammonia at equilibrium is equal to two atmospheres. Okay, so since we know that this is two atmospheres, we know then that the sum of the partial pressures of nitrogen and hydrogen, this is going to be equal to eight atmospheres. So this is equal to the partial pressure of nitrogen, and we could express the partial pressure of hydrogen in terms of nitrogen by replacing it with three times the partial pressure of nitrogen okay so solving for the partial pressure of nitrogen this gives us two atmospheres as well okay so when we solve for the partial pressure of hydrogen based on this so it's the partial pressure of nitrogen times three so this means that the partial pressure of hydrogen is equal to six atmospheres okay so finally plugging this in over here so kp this is equal to two atmospheres divided by the standard pressure, which is one atmosphere squared over two atmospheres divided by the standard pressure, one atmosphere times six atmospheres divided by the standard pressure, one atmosphere raised to three. Okay, note that all the pressure units cancel out. Okay, so that means Kp is expected to be unitless. Okay, so Kp is given as 9.26 times 10 to the negative 3. Okay, so note again that we pretty much based most of our analysis on the typical strategy for equilibrium problems. Okay, so we use an ice table to determine the corresponding partial pressure expressions at equilibrium. Okay, and we just took advantage of all the different values that are given based on the equilibrium composition to solve for our corresponding Kp. Okay. So now let's proceed to our next problem, okay? So our next problem allows us to calculate the equilibrium constant from changes in pressure, okay? So again, we'll be solving for Kp, and then later on we'll be solving for Kc. So again, we'll be assuming that we have ideal gas behavior here, okay? So again, we'll be dealing with an ice table, so initial change equilibrium of our corresponding partial pressures of our components, okay? So since all of our given are in terms of millimeters mercury, okay, so the partial pressures are in terms of millimeters mercury, okay? So let's look at what we're given first, okay? So we produce NOCl by reacting NO and chlorine gas in an empty vessel, okay? So we start with 300 millimeters mercury of NO and 250 millimeters mercury of chlorine gas, okay? So we don't have any product yet, okay? So ultimately, we know that the total equilibrium pressure is 420 millimeters mercury, okay? So based on this, we'll try to solve for the corresponding equilibrium partial pressures of each of the components, okay? So we could do this by solving for the equilibrium partial pressures based on the corresponding stoichiometric changes, okay? So we have negative x minus half x plus x, okay? So the equilibrium partial pressures can be expressed as 300 minus x, okay? 250 minus half x, and for our product, this is just going to be equal to x, okay? So overall, based on our given, we know that the total equilibrium pressure, okay, so our total equilibrium pressure, this is the sum of all the partial pressures of our components, okay, so our product, our reactants, okay, the sum of all of these partial pressures, this is going to be equal to 420 millimeters mercury, okay. So overall, we do have an expression for all of the 
equilibrium partial pressures in terms of one variable, okay? So we could ultimately solve for x at the end over here, okay? So our expression for the partial pressure of NO, this is 300 minus x, okay? So the partial pressure of chlorine gas, that is 250 minus 1 half x. And finally, for our product, that is just equal to x, okay? So this is all equal to 420 millimeters mercury, okay? So when we solve for x, okay, so x, this is just going to be equal to 260 millimeters mercury. So this is immediately equal to the partial pressure of our product, okay? So we could set this as 260 millimeters mercury, okay? So solving for the other components, okay? So 250 minus 1 half of 260, that is 120. And for our last one over here, 300 minus 260, so we have 40 millimeters mercury as our equilibrium partial pressure for NO, okay, 120 millimeters mercury for our equilibrium partial pressure for chlorine gas. So overall, we have all of our equilibrium partial pressures for all of our components. So we could use all that to solve for Kp. Okay, so our expression for Kp is the partial pressure of NOCl over the standard pressure divided by the partial pressure of NO over the standard pressure times the partial pressure of Cl2 over the standard pressure raised to 2. Okay, so inputting all of this, okay, we could write this in terms of millimeters mercury. Okay, so note that the standard pressure, this is equal to one atmosphere, right? Okay, but we could also express the standard pressure in terms of millimeters mercury. So this is going to be 760 millimeters mercury. So ultimately our expression is going to be 260 millimeters mercury, okay, so the equilibrium partial pressure of our product over 760, our standard pressure, divided by, okay, so 40 millimeters mercury over 760 millimeters mercury over 120 millimeters mercury over 760 millimeters mercury, all raised to half, okay? So overall, our Kp expression, this is 16.36, okay? So again, our Kp is unitless because all of the pressure units canceled out over here, okay? So again, you just have to be very, very wary about the units that we're using here, okay? So we always have to take into account that our Kp is relative to the standard state, which is one atmosphere, okay? So if we just calculated this using different pressure units, we'll get very different values, okay? So we just need to make sure that our equilibrium constant expressions are standardized with respect to a reference state, okay? So here we have our Kp expression. So our next task is just to calculate our Kc. Okay, so let's just move on to a fresh slide in order to calculate that. We know that Kc can be expressed as Kp over our RT over P0 expression raised to delta Ng. Okay, so based on our balanced chemical equation over here, our delta Ng, this is going to be equal to 1 minus 1 minus half, so this is equal to negative half, okay? So our Kc, okay, this is equal to our Kp, so that is 16.36, okay? So this is going to be divided by, okay, so R, that is 0 0.08206 liters atmosphere per mole Kelvin times R, temperature, so our temperature is 30 degrees Celsius, so converting that to Kelvin, that is 303.15 Kelvin, divided by the standard pressure, so that is one atmosphere, and we'll be raising all of this by negative half. Okay, so let's just check out the units, so we have atmosphere, atmosphere, Kelvin, Kelvin, and as expected, our Kc doesn't exactly become unitless like our Kp, okay, so our Kc this becomes equal to 81.60 molar raised to negative half, okay? So again, keep in mind that Kc, 
for gaseous systems doesn't necessarily have to be unitless. Okay, but it's important that Kp is the one that does become unitless. Okay, okay, so now let's look at our next problem. So for our next problem, we want to formulate an expression of our equilibrium constant Kp as a function of degree of dissociation alpha and the equilibrium pressure or dissociation pressure Pt for our reaction over here. Okay, so since we'll be using the term degree of dissociation, let's just define that really quickly. Okay, so alpha, this just tells us the number of moles of a species that gets dissociated over the initial number of moles of that species, okay? So we'll see how we could use that once we consider our ice table, okay? So again, we'll be using our typical strategy for dealing with equilibrium problems. We'll be considering the initial amounts, the changes, and the corresponding equilibrium amounts, okay? So this time, however, we'll be dealing with number of moles of each component, okay? So let's just say that we have an n number of moles of PCL5 as our starting point, okay? So we have 0, 0 of our products, okay? So we're considering how our PCL5 dissociates, okay? So the corresponding change here is that we have negative x, okay, plus x, and plus x, okay? So actually, we could express our corresponding change in equilibrium in terms of our alpha, okay? So our x over here, this tells us the amount of our initial amount of PCL5 that gets dissociated, okay? So this relates closely to our alpha, which tells us the number of moles of our species that gets dissociated per initial number of moles of our species, okay? So that means our x, this is pretty much equivalent to alpha times n, okay? So if we multiply our initial number of moles by alpha, we get the number of moles of dissociated species, okay? Which is pretty much equivalent to our x, okay? So we could also express our change as negative n alpha, okay? Plus n alpha and plus n alpha. Okay, so our, our equilibrium amount, this can be expressed as n minus n alpha, n alpha, and n alpha. Okay, okay, so let's also get an expression for Kp. Okay, so Kp, this can be expressed in terms of our partial pressures, right? So this is going to be the partial pressure of PCl3 over the standard pressure times the partial pressure of Cl2 over the standard pressure all divided by the partial pressure of PCL5 over the standard pressure, okay? Okay, so note that we can actually express our partial pressures in terms of mole fraction, okay? So recall again that the partial pressure of some component X can be expressed as its mole fraction in the entire mixture times the total pressure, okay? So we could rewrite our expression for Kp as the mole fraction of PCL3 times the total pressure over the standard pressure times the mole fraction of chlorine gas times the total pressure over the standard pressure over the mole fraction of PCL5 times the total pressure over the standard pressure, okay? So for, from our ice table, we could actually get expressions for mole fraction, okay? So over here, we're given the number of moles in terms of N and alpha, okay? So in order to get the mole fraction, we need to divide each of these terms by the total number of moles, okay? So the total number of moles, this is equal to the sum of the moles of each of the species at equilibrium, okay? So this is equal to N minus N alpha, which corresponds to the number of moles of PCL5, plus n alpha plus n alpha, okay? So this simplifies to n plus n alpha, okay? So we could get an expression for the mole fraction of each of these components, okay? So for PCL5, this is n minus n alpha over n plus n alpha, okay? So we could note here that our n actually cancels out, okay? So our overall expression is ultimately 1 minus alpha over 1 plus alpha, okay? 
So over here as well, we could divide this by n plus n alpha and n plus n alpha. Okay, so the mole fraction of PCL3, this is going to be equal to alpha over 1 plus alpha. Okay, same thing goes for chlorine gas. Okay, so alpha over 1 plus alpha. Okay, so you could actually see here that the mole fraction becomes independent of the initial number of moles of our PCL5. Okay, so let's input this expression into our Kp expression, which is in terms of mole fraction and total pressure. Okay, so let's just move on to a fresh slide. Okay, so for each of these terms, let's just write out the corresponding partial pressures. Okay, so for PCL5, we have 1 minus alpha over 1 plus alpha times the total pressure. Okay, so for PCL3, we have alpha over 1 plus alpha times the total pressure, and the same thing goes for our chlorine gas. So alpha over 1 plus alpha times the total pressure. Okay, so for Kp, okay, so this is just the partial pressure of PCL3, right? So that is alpha over 1 plus alpha times Pt over the standard pressure times alpha over 1 plus alpha times Pt over the standard pressure. So this is the expression for chlorine gas. And this is all over the expression for PCL5. So this is 1 minus alpha over 1 plus alpha times Pt over P0. Okay, so we could see here that our expression can simplify a lot. Okay, so we could cancel out these two terms of Pt over P0. And we could also cancel out one of the 1 plus alpha terms here. Okay, so ultimately our expression simplifies out to alpha squared. Okay, times Pt over P0 over, okay, so we're still left with this and this term over here. So this is 1 plus alpha times 1 minus alpha. Okay, so upon further simplification, we could just write this out as alpha squared over 1 minus alpha squared times Pt over P0. Okay, so this is our expression of our Kp as a function of our degree of dissociation and our total pressure. Okay, so overall if we have information about the degree of dissociation and the total pressure, we could calculate for our Kp. So overall these are just some examples of problems that we may encounter for chemical equilibrium problems. Okay, so always keep in mind that We'll be seeing lots of different variations of these types of problems, but overall, they're usually just based on the typical strategy of using ice tables. So overall, now that we're familiar with determining the equilibrium constant, now let's look at different factors that could affect our equilibrium system, okay? So overall, we're familiar with Le Chatelier's principle, okay? So Le Chatelier's principle gives us a general idea of how our equilibrium can be affected by different stresses, okay? So Le Chatelier's principle states that if a stress is applied on an equilibrium system, the system will counteract the stress to restore equilibrium, okay? So overall, whenever we apply a stress to our equilibrium system, we change the value of our Q. So overall, we could compare the value of Q after the stress is applied to our equilibrium constant to see which direction our system will shift to in order to restore equilibrium. Okay, so let's just recall some of the things that we discussed earlier. Okay, so we know that if our QA is less than our equilibrium constant, that means our delta G is less than zero, so our reaction is spontaneous in the forward direction. Okay, so therefore, our reaction will shift forward. Okay, if however, our QA is greater than Ka, that means our delta G is greater than zero, so therefore the process is non-spontaneous in the forward direction, but it is spontaneous in the reverse direction, so therefore we have a backward shift. So we'll be discussing different types of stresses on our equilibrium system. So stresses includes changing the amounts of our reactants and products, okay, so changing the pressure and volume, adding inert gases, and also changing the temperature in our system. Okay, so later on we'll also look at other effects such as the effects of electrolytes on our equilibrium. So first let's consider our example system over here. So we have hydrogen sulfide gas reacting with iodine solid to form two moles of hydrogen iodide gas and sulfur solid. Okay, so for simplicity we'll be expressing the equilibrium constant in terms of Kc. Okay, so we have the concentration of our hydrogen iodide gas 
over the concentration of our hydrogen sulfide gas. Note that we omitted the presence of our solids because their activities are equal to 1, just so long as they are present, of course. Okay, so let's take into account our first factor. Okay, so let's look at when we change the amounts of reactant or product. So what happens if we add reactant? So let's take into account what happens to our corresponding Q. So if we add reactant, we're increasing the amount of our hydrogen sulfide. So if we're going to be comparing this now to our equilibrium constant, our Q now becomes less than our Kc. So therefore, we have a forward shift in our equilibrium, okay? So again, we're adding hydrogen sulfide, okay? So that means we have too much reactant present now. So that means our reaction is going to shift forward to produce more product in order to restore equilibrium, okay? So if, however, we start adding product, okay? So we could look at what happens to our Q, okay? So in this case, we're increasing our numerator over here. So that means our Q becomes larger than our Kc. So that means we have a shift backwards, Okay, so in this particular case, we're adding too much product now. Okay, so that means our reaction is going to be shifting backwards in order to produce more of our reactant so we could restore equilibrium. Okay, so now let's look at what happens when we remove our reactants and products. Okay, so if we remove our reactant, okay, so we decrease our denominator in our Q over here. So this implies that our Q is going to be greater than our Kc. So therefore, we have a shift backwards, okay? So ultimately, we're removing our reactant over here, okay? So that means our reaction is going to be shifting backwards so that we could restore the equilibrium concentration of our reactant over here, okay? So if we remove product, on the other hand, we'll be decreasing our numerator. So that means our Q, this is going to be less than our expected Kc. So therefore, we have a shift forward, okay? So decreasing our product shifts our reaction forward so that we could restore the equilibrium amount of product over here, okay? So now what happens when we take into account the removal or addition of our condensed phase reactant or product? So if we start to remove some iodine solid and some sulfur solid, okay, we could note that it's not really included in our Q expression over here. So actually, if we change the amount of condensed phase reactant or product, there is no effect because the activity of those condensed phase reactants or products are always going to be equal to 1 just so long as they are present. Okay, so this is the important part, guys, that we just have to make sure that there's still some of our condensed phase reactant or product present. Okay, so if we change if we drastically change the amount of reactant or products such as the extent that we completely remove the condensed phase reactant or product okay so let's investigate the qa expression over here okay so we actually have the activity of sulfur and the activity of iodine over here so if, for example, we remove our solid reactant, okay, so this means that the activity of our iodine becomes equal to zero because it's no longer present in our system, okay? So if we consider our QA, that means this becomes zero. So if we have a zero in our denominator, this implies that our QA, this becomes infinity, okay? So this is obviously going to be much larger than our equilibrium constant. So if our QA is greater than our equilibrium constant, we have a shift backwards so that we could start reforming our lost reactant, okay? If, however, we remove our sulfur, okay, so this means that our activity of our sulfur upon removal becomes equal to zero because, again, it's no longer present in our system, okay? So if our numerator here becomes equal to zero, our QA becomes equal to zero. So that means the reaction quotient is less than the equilibrium constant. So this means that we have a shift forward so that we could start reforming our lost product in our system. Okay, so now let's look at changes in pressure and volume for gaseous systems, okay? So in our particular example, we're still dealing with gaseous reactants and products. So we'll definitely see changes in pressure and volume for our system here. Okay, so let's take into account first what happens if we increase the pressure or decrease the volume, okay? So we could 
analyze what happens here by manipulating our expression for Kc over here. So recall again that Kc expresses the amount of gas in our system in terms of molar concentration. Okay, So overall, we could express the concentration of Hi as the number of moles of Hi over the total volume of our system squared over the number of moles of H2S over the corresponding volume. Okay, so note guys that the volume for both of these cases over here is actually the same. It's just the total volume of the system. Okay, so we could rewrite this expression as the number of moles of Hi squared over the number of moles of H2S. Okay, so this is 1 over volume squared over 1 over volume. Okay, so this could simplify out. Okay, so this is going to be number of moles of Hi squared over number of moles of H2S times 1 over volume. Okay, so we can definitely see more clearly here what happens to our system once we change our volume. Okay, so let's consider our QC. Okay, so our QC is going to have a similar expression over here. So we have number of moles of Hi squared over number of moles of H2S times 1 over volume. So if we decrease the volume, what happens to our QC is that it becomes larger than our Kc. Okay, So the overall effect here is that we have a backwards shift. Okay, So it actually shifts to the side with fewer moles of gas in our system. Okay, So in our particular Example over here, the side that has fewer moles of gas is the reactant side. Okay, so overall, if we decrease the volume of a gaseous system, the shift in equilibrium will tend to go to the side with fewer moles of gas. So we can see that the shift really goes towards the side with fewer moles of gas if we look at different types of reactions. Okay, let's try to see the shift in equilibrium if we happen to have more moles of gas in the reactant side. Okay, so let's say that we have 2A gas in equilibrium with B moles of gas. Okay, so in this case, we could express our Kc as the concentration of B over the concentration of A squared. So this is just the number of moles of B over the volume divided by the number of moles of A over the volume squared. Okay, so this is just number of moles of B times 1 over V over number of moles of A squared over 1 over V squared. Okay, so in this case, since we have more moles of gas in the reactant side, the 1 over V term is retained on the bottom over here upon cancellation. Okay, so if we cancel this over here, we get NB over NA squared times 1 over V. Okay, so this, this can be rewritten as NB over NA squared times V. So if we write out the QC expression, this is going to be NB over NA squared times V. So if we decrease the volume then, our QC expression becomes less than our KC expression. Okay, So therefore, in this particular case, we have a forward shift. Okay, But note that it's consistent with our earlier analysis because this forward shift corresponds to a shift to the side with fewer moles of gas. Okay, so question here, guys, what happens if we have equal number of moles of gas on each side? So what happens if we change the volume? Okay, so it's expected that since we have our 1 over V terms cancel out, our volume term does not appear in our QC expression, so therefore we expect to have no shift in equilibrium. So we can see here that changes in pressure and volume for gaseous systems become significant if we have differences in the number of moles of gases in our reactants versus our products. Okay, so let's just analyze what happens if we do the reverse. Okay, so if we decrease the pressure or increase the volume. Okay, so we could do the same analysis for our reaction system over here. Okay, so our Kc expression is just number of moles of Hi squared over the number of moles of H2S times 1 over V. Okay, so upon increasing the volume, our Kc expression becomes less than our Kc, so therefore we have a shift forward. Okay, so upon increasing the volume, we have a shift towards the side with more moles of gas.
So if we apply that for our other reaction, in which we have more moles of gas in the reactant side, we expect to have a shift backwards upon increasing the volume. Okay? But in general, of course, upon increasing the volume, we just shift towards the side with more moles of gas in our system. So again, if there's no side that has more moles of gas, that means there's no shift in equilibrium. All right, so now let's look at a related case. Okay, so what happens when we start adding inert gases to our system? Okay, so inert gases meaning that they don't really, really react with our system over here. Okay, so the typical inert gas that we add are our noble gases like helium or argon. So there's two possible cases in which we add an inert gas. Okay, so the first case is when we add the inert gas at constant pressure conditions. So let's consider our initial equilibrium over here. Let's say that the total pressure is one atmosphere. So this one atmosphere takes into account the partial pressure of our reactants and our products in our system at equilibrium. Okay, so if we add an inert gas over here at constant pressure, okay, Inevitably, we have to increase the total volume of our system in order to ensure that the total pressure remains at one atmosphere. So upon applying the stress, while we try to maintain a constant one atmosphere condition, okay, this implies that the partial pressures of our hydrogen and our hydrogen sulfide decrease in order to accommodate the additional inert gas over here. Okay, so this will obviously impact our Kp expression, which is the partial pressure of Hi over the partial pressure of H2S. Okay, so upon adding the inert gas, we see a change in our Q expression. So we could also analyze this using our earlier analysis as well. Okay, so note here that upon adding our inert gas at constant pressure, okay, so the volume over here is less than the volume upon adding our inert gas. Okay, so the effect here at, of adding an inert gas constant pressure is pretty much the same effect of increasing the total volume of our system. Okay, so we said earlier that if we increase the volume of a gaseous system, the tendency is, is that we're going to be shifting our equilibrium towards the side that has more moles of gas. Okay, so we'll be shifting to side with more moles of gas. So in this particular example, we'll be shifting our equilibrium forward in order to restore our equilibrium. So just to summarize all this, at constant pressure upon adding an inert gas, the tendency is, is that we increase the volume of the system in order to accommodate that inert gas. So the shift in equilibrium is consistent upon just increasing the volume of the system, okay? So in our earlier analysis, we said that if we increase the volume of a system, we tend to, again, shift to the side with more moles of gas, okay? So in our particular example, we'll be shifting forward. Another way of looking at it is looking at it in terms of the partial pressure change, okay? So our expression for QP is the partial pressure of HI squared over the partial pressure of H2S. So as we saw earlier from our illustration, that upon adding our inert gas at constant pressure, we effectively decreased both the partial pressure of our HI and our H2S. But we can see here we have a greater effect on the decrease of pressure on our hydrogen iodide because we square its partial pressure, okay? So therefore, we see a general decrease in the QP. So ultimately, our QP becomes less than our KP. So again, we see a shift forward in our equilibrium, okay? But overall, this is consistent with the fact that we shifted towards the side with more moles of gas. Okay, so just be wary again, guys, that if we happen to have more moles of gas in the reactant side, okay, adding an inert gas at constant pressure will shift towards the reactant side that time. Okay?
So the next possible case of adding an inert gas is at constant volume, okay? So let's just analyze what happens if we try to add an inert gas in a rigid container, okay? So let's say that this is our initial equilibrium over here, okay? So say that our total pressure in this case is, again, one atmosphere. So this is the sum of our partial pressures here. So if we add an inert gas at constant volume, okay, so of course, our total volume of this system is going to be remaining the same, but what happens is, is that in order to accommodate the initial inert gas, is that the total pressure has to change, okay? So the total pressure is going to be the partial pressures of our original components plus the partial pressure of the added gas. But note, however, that the partial pressures of our products and our reactants does not change, okay? So this is still equivalent to a total of one atmosphere, okay? So since we do not see any change in our partial pressures, okay, we actually expect that there is no change in our equilibrium if we add an inert gas at constant volume, okay? So again, this is due to the fact that the partial pressures remain the same after the addition of the inert gas, okay? So we could also look at it in terms of changing the volume, right? Okay, so in this particular case, we see no change in volume, so therefore, there is no shift in equilibrium. So overall, that is the effect of adding an inert gas, okay? So again, if we add the inert gas at different conditions, we expect to see different types of effects on the equilibrium system. Okay, so our next factor is the effect of temperature, okay? So, so keep in mind that if we change the temperature, this will ultimately change the value of K. So previously, when we were looking at the effects of adding reactants or changing the pressure and volume, the equilibrium constant remained the same, okay? So the only thing that will change the equilibrium constant is if we change the temperature. So the way that our equilibrium constant is going to change depends on the nature of our reaction. So recall from your general chemistry that if we have a reaction A plus B in equilibrium with C and it happens to be an exothermic reaction, we could treat our heat as sort of a as sort of a product. So if we increase the temperature, the tendency is is that we have a backward shift, right? Okay, so for an exothermic process, if we increase the temperature, we have a backward shift. Okay. However, if we decrease the temperature, Okay, the tendency is, is that we have a forward shift. So again, this affects the value of our equilibrium constant. Okay, so if we increase the temperature and we have a corresponding backward shift, this implies that our equilibrium constant should it increase or decrease upon increasing temperature. Okay, so if we increase the temperature based on exothermic reaction, we have a backward shift, right? So that means we tend to form more reactants, okay? So this means that our equilibrium constant tends to decrease upon increasing temperature, okay? So again, if we decrease the temperature, however, we have a forward shift, so this implies that we form more products, okay? So therefore, our equilibrium constant increases. If, however, we have an endothermic process, okay? So this means that our heat is treated as a reactant, okay? So if our process is endothermic, okay? So upon increasing the temperature, the tendency is, is that we have a shift forward. So this is in contrast to our exothermic reaction in, in which we have a backward shift, okay? So if, however, we decrease the temperature, we tend to have a shift backwards, okay? So this is opposite to the case if, in which we have an endothermic reaction. So again, if we increase the temperature, this implies that we have a forward shift. So this means that we tend to increase our equilibrium constant. And if we have a decrease in temperature, we have a backward shift. So this means we tend to decrease our equilibrium constant. Okay, so overall, we could see here that the shift in equilibrium for changing the temperature is dependent on the overall enthalpy of our reaction. So let's try to get an equation that relates to change in equilibrium constant with change in temperature and see how the enthalpy of the reaction factors into that expression, okay? So let's first start with our general expression that relates our delta G naught with our equilibrium constant. Okay, so we have negative RT ln Ka. So again, our objective is to see how this expression changes with temperature. Okay, so let's start with our expression that relates our delta G naught 
with our equilibrium constant. Okay, so delta G naught is equal to negative RT ln Ka. Okay, so let's just rearrange this a little bit. So let's write this as ln Ka is equal to negative delta G naught over RT. So our overall objective is to determine how our equilibrium constant changes with temperature. Okay, so we could investigate this by getting the derivative with respect to temperature. Let's evaluate this expression over here. So this is dLn Ka over dt is equal to, okay, so let's take out the negative 1 over r constant, so negative 1 over r, and we'll be evaluating the derivative of delta G naught over t. So if we're evaluating this expression over here, we need to use the quotient rule, right? Okay, so Let's just evaluate this really quickly on the side. So, so the derivative of delta G naught over T with respect to T, this is going to be equal to temperature times the derivative of delta G naught with respect to T. Okay, so note that this is at constant pressure minus delta G naught times the derivative of T with respect to T at constant pressure all over T squared. Okay, so... The derivative of t with respect to t, okay, so if we're getting derivative of a variable with respect to itself, this is just equal to 1, okay? So from our previous discussion, we know that the partial of delta g with respect to t at constant pressure, this is equal to negative entropy, okay? So negative delta s naught, okay? So our expression becomes negative t delta s naught minus delta g naught over t squared. Okay, so recall our expression for delta G. So delta G naught is equal to delta H naught minus T delta S. Okay, so that means that this expression on top over here, this is equal to negative delta H naught over T squared. Okay, so we could make that replacement now over here. Okay, so dlnka over dt, this is equal to, okay, so negative 1 over r times negative delta h naught over t squared, so that is delta h naught over r times 1 over t squared, okay? So additional notes, by the way, guys, this expression that we just derived, the derivative of delta g naught over t with respect to t, this is called your Gibbs-Helmholtz equation. Okay, so this just tells us the variation of delta G with temperature and how it's related to our delta H. Okay, so let's continue our derivation over here. Okay, so let's do some rearrangement. Let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so we have again dLnKa over dt. So this is equal to delta H naught over RT squared. Okay, so let's move our delta t on the other side so we have d l n k a is equal to delta h naught over r d t over t squared okay so we could do some integration with this okay so let's do some definite integration first okay so we'll be integrating this from l n k a 1 and l n k a 2 and we'll be integrating this from temperature 1 to temperature 2. So keep in mind that if we integrate this we'll be assuming that our enthalpy of our reaction is constant in the temperature range of interest. Okay so upon integrating this with our limits we have l n k a 2 minus l n k a 1 is equal to negative delta h naught over r times 1 over t 2 over 1 over t 1 okay so if we rearrange this a little bit we can get l n k a 2 over k a 1 is equal to negative delta h naught over r times 1 over t 2 minus 1 over t 1 Okay, so you could note here this looks a lot like the cloches clapeyron equation, right? But this here, this relates the equilibrium constants with temperature, okay? So this here, this is called your Van Hoff equation, okay? So this tells us the variation of our equilibrium constants with temperature. So we could have also integrated our expression actually using indefinite integration, okay? So let's just try this out again, okay? So we had d l n k a is equal to delta h naught over r times dt over t squared, 
Okay, so upon doing indefinite integration, we'll get ln ka is equal to negative delta h naught over r times 1 over t plus some integration constant. So actually, we can plot this over here. So say that this 1 over t here is plotted as our x and ln ky is plotted as our y. So this means that the slope is going to be negative delta h naught over r and our intercept is going to be c over here. Okay, so for an endothermic reaction, so if we plot ln k over here and 1 over t over here, okay, so an endothermic reaction has delta H naught as positive, so we expect to see a negative slope, okay, so our slope over here is going to be negative delta H naught over R, okay. So overall, the tendency is that if we increase the temperature, okay, so note that temperature is plotted on the x-axis as the inverse, okay, so if we increase the temperature, Temperature, we're going towards this side of the plot over here. Okay, so the tendency is upon increasing temperature, we increase ln ka. So this implies that we increase the ka. Okay, so this is consistent with our earlier analysis for increasing the temperature. We tend to see a forward shift in our reaction, so therefore an increase in ka. Okay, so forward shift. Okay, so for an exothermic reaction, on the other hand, okay, so our delta H naught is going to be negative, so therefore we expect to see a positive slope over here when we plot ln Ka against 1 over T. Okay, so again, if we increase the temperature, we're going in this direction for the plot, right? Okay, so upon increasing temperature, we see that we have a decrease in ln Ka, so therefore we see a decrease in Ka. Okay, so again, this is consistent with our analysis that when we increase the temperature for an exothermic reaction, we have a decrease in Ka, so therefore we have a backward shift. So overall, this is how we can determine the effect of changing the temperature on our equilibrium system. Okay, so overall, it actually changes the value of our equilibrium constant. Okay, so keep in mind again that it's only the effect of temperature that will ultimately change the value of our equilibrium constant. Okay, so let's apply our Van't Hoff equation over here. Okay, so in this particular problem, we have a dissociation reaction of ammonium chloride at different temperatures, and we're given the corresponding dissociation pressures. Okay, so these pressures just correspond to the total pressure of the system at equilibrium, okay? So we could use this data to calculate the different Kp's at the different temperatures, and from this we could calculate our delta H naught, okay? Assuming, of course, that it's constant within the temperature range of interest, okay? So before we begin, we need to write out a balanced chemical equation, okay, for the dissociation of ammonium chloride solid, okay? So we have ammonium chloride solid, so this dissociates into ammonium gas and hydrogen chloride gas, okay? So again, we'll be using our typical strategy of using an ice table in terms of partial pressures, okay? So let's indicate the initial change and the equilibrium amounts, okay? So this is all going to be in partial pressures. Okay, so let's write down a Kp expression first, okay? So Kp, this is going to be just the partial pressure of ammonia over the standard pressure times the partial pressure of HCl over the standard pressure. Okay, so note that we're not going to be including the term for ammonium chloride solid anymore since its activity is assumed to be 1. Okay, since we're taking into account a dissociation process, we can initially assume that we just have the solid present and we have none of the products present initially. So the corresponding changes will be plus x plus x. Okay, so equilibrium pressures will be equal to x and x. Okay, so for our particular example, we're given the total pressures, right? Okay, so Pt, this is going to be equal to the partial pressure of ammonia plus the partial pressure of HCl. Okay, so that means that Pt is is equal to 2x, okay, so the total pressure divided by 2 will give us the corresponding partial pressures of our components at each given temperature over here, okay, so at 427 degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to 700 Kelvin, Pt is equal to 608 kilopascals, okay, so this is equal to 2x, okay, so this means that x is equal to 304 kPa.
Okay, so this is the corresponding partial pressure of both ammonia and hydrogen chloride. Okay, so solving for Kp, this will be 304 kilopascals. Okay, so we need to divide this by the standard pressure. Okay, so recall again that the standard pressure, this is equal to one atmosphere. So in terms of kilopascal, this is 101.325 kilopascal. Okay, so we could just divide our pressure over here by the standard pressure in terms of kilopascals, so that is 101.325 pas kilopascal, okay, times 304 kilopascal over 101.325 kilopascal, okay. So the Kp at 700 Kelvin, this is equal to 9, okay, so nice value over here. Okay, so the problem also asks for the, the standard Gibbs free energy, so that is equal to negative RT ln Kp. Okay, so this is just equal to negative 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times 700 Kelvin times ln of 9. So that is equal to, so just squeezing this over here, negative 12.79 kilojoules per mole. So there we have it. We're just applying our equations over here. Okay, so we could do the same treatment for our other temperature. Okay, so let's just move on to a fresh slide over here. Okay, so the total pressure at 459 degrees Celsius, which is equivalent to 732 Kelvin, the total pressure is equal to 1115 kilopascals. Okay, so this is equal to 2x. Okay, so if we solve for x then, x is equal to 557.5 kilopascals. Okay, so this is equal to the partial pressure of ammonia and also the partial pressure of HCl at equilibrium at this higher temperature. Okay, so solving for Kb, okay, so this is just going to be 557.5 kilopascals over the standard pressure, so 101.325 kilopascals times the same thing, so 557.5 kilopascals over 101.325 kilopascals. So upon calculating this, our Kp is equal to 30.27. So we could also calculate the delta G naught. Okay, so delta G naught, this is just equal to, again, negative RT ln Kp, so upon plugging everything in, we'll get negative 20.75 kilojoules per mole. So we can see here that upon increasing the temperature in this reaction, the Kp increases. So therefore, this implies that our reaction is endothermic. Okay, so we could confirm this by calculating the actual value of our enthalpy using the Van't Hoff equation. Okay, so let's just move on to a fresh slide again. Okay, so let's write down the things that we know. Okay, so our Kp1, this is equal to 9. So the temperature that this corresponds to is 700 Kelvin. Okay, and then our Kp2, this is equal to 30.27. So the temperature this corresponds to is 732 Kelvin. Okay, so our Van't Hoff equation, this is just ln Kp2 over Kp1 is equal to negative delta H0 over R times 1 over T2 minus 1 over temperature 1. Okay, so what we're solving for in this particular case is the enthalpy of the reaction. Okay, so just plugging everything in. Okay, so we have 30.27 over 9. This is equal to negative delta H0 over R. Okay, so our R, this is just going to be 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin times 1 over temperature 2, 732 Kelvin minus 1 over 700 Kelvin. Okay, so upon solving for a delta H naught, we expect to get positive 50.44 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so again, as suspected, our enthalpy of reaction is positive because upon increasing the temperature, we increased the equilibrium constant. Okay, so therefore we see we expect to see a shift forward. Okay, so overall this is the application of your Van Toff equation, which determines the effect of temperature on the equilibrium constant. Okay.
So next, we'll be investigating other changes, other factors affecting equilibrium. Okay, so some of these factors aren't necessarily as straightforward as the ones that we just looked at earlier. Let's look at a very common experiment that's usually conducted during general chemistry laboratory classes. Okay, so let's consider this system over here. So this is a complexation system. Okay, so you have iron 3 reacting with thiocyanide to form a complex over here that is characteristically blood red. Okay, so this is a very nice system to investigate uh, ch shifts in equilibrium because if we shift to the forward, we tend to have a darker solution that results. And if we shift backwards, we have a lighter solution that results since we tend to form more of the lighter colored reactants. Okay, so let's look at the effect of adding some reagents to the system. Okay, so let's look at when we add equal amounts of ferric nitrate solution okay so the effect of adding ferric nitrate solution is straightforward we are pretty much just increasing the amount of reactant right so if we increase the amount of reactant the tendency is that we have a forward shift so the expected observation is that we're going to have a darker solution okay so again a darker solution implies that we have a forward shift in equilibrium okay so next if we add silver nitrate okay so silver nitrate this is ultimately going to affect one of the reactants here okay so the tendency is that we if we add silver ions to our solution this is going to react with our thiocyanate ion to form a precipitate is so the overall effect here is that we decreased the amount of reactant here by making it react with another species, okay? So our expected shift in equilibrium here is that we have a shift backwards, okay? So the observation here is that you have a lighter solution and you also have the formation of a white precipitate which corresponds to this species over here, okay? So ultimately, this corresponds to a backward shift, right? Okay, but sometimes in these experiments, we add a salt instead, okay? So what we add here is potassium nitrate. So potassium doesn't seem to be reacting directly with any of our species over here and neither does nitrate. Okay, But whenever we add potassium nitrate, the observation that we tend to observe is that we have a lighter solution. So the implications of a lighter solution is that we had a backward shift in equilibrium. But the effect of this salt over here isn't obvious because it doesn't really interact directly with any of our species over here. This is an interesting thing to note for this type of system here. So we see this effect not only for this system, but we also see it for other ionic equilibrium systems, such as precipitation. So if we add potassium nitrate to a saturated solution of silver chloride, what we tend to observe is that the solubility increases. So this corresponds to a shift forward in equilibrium. Okay, so this is in contrast to our initial example in which we had our complexation system so the effect of adding potassium nitrate is that you had lighter solutions so that means we actually had a shift backwards okay so we have different types of shifts in our equilibrium over here so we actually do see shifts in equilibrium by adding an inert salt okay so actually this has a special name this is called the uncommon ion effect so the effect of adding this inert salt is important for ionic equilibrium. Okay, so in these types of equilibria, so earlier we talked about complexation of ions and we also talked about the solubility of an ionic salt. These types of equilibrium systems are sensitive to ionic interactions. Okay, so it's sensitive to the number of ions in solution. Okay, so let's look at this a little bit more closely. Let's take into account our silver chloride precipitation equilibrium process, okay? So if we have ions in solution, okay, so let's say that we have an ideal solution. Okay, so recall again that whenever we have an ideal solution, this means that we have a very, very, very dilute solution. So in fact, to be more specific, an ideal solution is considered to be an infinitely dilute solution. Okay, so of course this is kind of impossible to achieve, but we could we could just approximate ideal solution behavior. Okay, but anyway, if we have a very dilute solution, 
Okay, we could take into consideration the interaction between these two ions. Okay, so in order for these two ions to precipitate, they need to be interacting with one another, right? Okay, so since we have super dilute solutions, we see that we have full attraction between these ions. However, if we start to have non-ideal solutions, okay, so the non-ideal solution in which there's a significant amount of other ions in solution, the tendency is, is that our anions and cations will be surrounded by ions of the opposite charge, okay? So our silver cation here will tend to develop a negatively charged sphere of ions around it, and our chloride anion over here will tend to develop an atmosphere of positive charges that are attracted to it as well. Okay, so this is called your counter ion atmosphere. Okay, so these ions could be your inert ions that we discussed earlier. For example, if we added potassium nitrate over here, your silver ions could be surrounded by nitrate ions and your chloride ions could be surrounded by potassium ions. Okay, so the overall effect of this is that if these two ions want to interact with one another to form the precipitate, we actually have a decreased attraction now between them because the counter ion atmosphere decreases their effective concentration. So these two ions can no longer feel the full attraction between them. So in effect, it's like we decrease the effective concentration of these two species in solution. So the counter ion atmosphere kind of shields the ion from reacting with its other ion. Okay? So this theory of ionic interaction is actually called the Debye-Huckel theory. Okay, so this takes into account the effect of electrolytes on ionic equilibrium systems. So overall, if we tend to increase the concentration of our solute, so say that we start to increase, start to add even more potassium nitrate into our solution, the tendency is that if we increase the ions in solution, we tend to increase the ionic atmosphere we tend to increase the charge of our ionic atmosphere that surrounds our ions. So overall, we have a decreased attraction between any cation and anion and have an effective, so we ultimately have a decrease in the effective concentration of our ionic reactants and products in our system. So the overall effect of increasing the number of ions in solution is that you have a promotion of dissociation into ions. Okay, so if we look at our silver chloride precipitation reaction, okay, so if we increase the number of ions in solution, the tendency is, is that we have a shift forward. Okay, so you have an increase in solubility. Okay, so you can look at this as sort of decreasing the effective concentration of these ions in solution, okay? So upon decreasing the effective concentration of these ions, you have a shift forward in equilibrium. So on the side, we could also look at the effect of the ions in solution on our complexation process, okay? So again, since we decrease the effective concentration of our ionic reactants and products, we again promote the dissociation into ions, okay? So our complex here will tend to dissociate into its constituent ions, okay? So that's why we tend to see an opposite shift for our complexation process over here, okay? So all of these principles here are also confirmed by the fact that whenever we add a non-electrolyte to our solution, there's not much of an effect on the solubility of our electrolyte, okay? But we have to be very careful, however, in making generalizations. So we just have to be wary of the, the identity of our electrolyte, okay? So for potassium nitrate, our cation and anion is uncommon with respect to our reaction over here, okay? But if we take into account another electrolyte over here, KCl, okay, we see a decrease in solubility of silver chloride because of a completely different reason, okay? So we see that we actually have a common ion effect because KCl increases the concentration of chloride chloride ions in solution, so therefore we expect to see a, a backward shift whenever we add this particular salt in our solution. So how can we quantify the ions in solution, okay? So we quantify the ions in solution by measuring ionic strength. So the ionic strength is a measure of the total concentration of ionic charge in solution, okay? So aside from considering the concentration of the ion in solution, you also have to take into account its charge, okay? So let's try calculating the ionic strength for some of these examples over here, okay? So for, for 0.01 molar sodium chloride, 
Okay, we could calculate the ionic charge as follows. Okay, so the ionic charge is equal to one half times the concentration of sodium ions in solution times the charge squared plus the concentration of chloride ions in solution times negative one squared. Okay, so upon calculating this, we have 0 0.010 molar times plus one squared plus 0 0.010 molar times negative 1 squared. So all of this is just equal to 0 0.010 molar. Okay, so if we have a solution and we just have a one-to-one -one electrolyte in solution, the ionic strength is pretty much just equal to the concentration of the electrolyte. Okay, so let's look at other examples. Okay, so the ionic strength equation for this is going to be the concentration of sodium ions in solution times the charge squared, plus the concentration of sulfate ions in solution times the charge squared. Okay, so this is going to be equal to, okay, so the concentration of sodium ions in, cons in solution is going to be equal to 2 times the concentration of the electrolyte here. Okay, so we have 2 times 0 0.010 molar times plus 1 squared plus the concentrate of sulfate ions in solution times negative 2 squared. So this here, this is going to be equal to 0 0.030 molar. Okay, so if we have a mixture of these two salts, let's try to get the ionic strength for this mixture now. Okay, so we'll be taking into account the concentration of sodium ions times its charge squared plus the concentration of chloride ions times its charge squared plus the concentration of sulfate ions times the charge squared. Okay, so getting our expression for ionic strength. Okay, so when we're taking into account the concentration of sodium ions, we need to take into account the two sources over here. So we have 0 0.010 molar from the sodium chloride over here, plus two times 0 0.010 molar from our sodium sulfate over here. Okay, so we multiply this by the charge squared, so we just consider the chloride ions over here times the charge squared and finally the sulfate ions. Okay, so 0 0.010 molar okay, times negative 2 squared. Okay, so upon calculating this, this ends up being 0 0.040 molar. Okay, so actually this is pretty much just the ionic strength of our solution over here plus the ionic strength of our other solution over here. So ionic strengths are nicely additive. Okay, so how can we now see the effect of ionic strength on our equilibrium system? Okay, so what does it affect exactly? Okay, so let's just recall the activity of solutes. Okay, so we define the activity of a solute as the concentration of that solute over the standard state times the activity coefficient, okay? So it's actually this activity coefficient that takes into account the non-ideality of our solution that's related to our ionic strength, okay? So again, just recall for an ideal solution, our gamma is approaching 1, so this means that our activity is pretty much approaching approaching the concentration of our solution, okay? But for non-ideal solutions, the activity coefficient tends to be less than 1. So from what we saw earlier, if we tend to increase the ionic strength of our solution, the tendency is, is that we should also decrease the activity coefficient because we're ultimately decreasing the effective concentration of our solutes in our non-ideal solution. Okay, so in general, we expect that if we increase the ionic strength, we have a decrease in our activity coefficient. Okay, so let's bring this all together in terms of our equilibrium constant. Okay, so here's our equilibrium constant in terms of activities. We could expand the activity terms in terms of concentration and activity coefficient, and we could also separate our activity coefficient terms from our concentration terms. Okay, so overall we could express our equilibrium constant in terms of activities as a product of the activity coefficient terms times the concentration equilibrium constant, okay? So again, this is our thermodynamic equilibrium constant. So it's this term over here that is constant with any ionic strength, okay? So this is only going to change 
with temperature, okay? So what does change with ionic strength, however, is this concentration equilibrium constant, okay? So that's how we see a change in the corresponding solubilities of ionic systems, for example. So the change is manifested here and reflected in our correction factor, okay? So this factor over here, this is where we see corrections that account for our ionic strength in solution, okay? So for example, if we want to determine the concentration of a particular ion in solution, we usually use the concentration equilibrium constant to determine just that. Okay, so let's see how we could relate the activity coefficient to our ionic strength. But before we go into that, let's define our mean activity coefficient, okay? So actually, the determination of activity coefficient for individual ions is very difficult to do. So typically, what's being done instead is that we get the so-called mean activity coefficient for our electrolyte instead. So in general, for an electrolyte of the following, okay, so this dissociates into A number of cations and B number of anions, okay, the mean activity coefficient for this electrolyte is given as follows, okay, so we just express this as the geometric mean. Gamma plus over here, this is the activity coefficient of the cation, and gamma minus over here, this is the activity coefficient of the anion, okay? Practically speaking, however, we usually just determine the mean activity coefficient for both of these ions here, okay? So the debye huckel theory gives us a relationship between mean activity coefficient and ionic strength, okay? So here for dilute aqueous solutions at 25 degrees Celsius, we could apply the debye huckel limiting law, okay? So this tells us that the log of our mean activity coefficient is equal to negative 0.509 times the absolute value of the charges of our ions times the square root of our ionic strength, okay? So note that this equation is usually applied only for very dilute solutions, okay? So there's a lot of other equations that can be adapted for more dilute solutions, but for the purposes of our discussion, we'll be limiting ourselves to dilute aqueous solutions at 25 degrees Celsius, okay? So again, just keep in mind that Z plus, Z minus, these corresponds to the charges of the ions, and I corresponds to the ionic strength, okay? So from our debye huckel limiting law, we could see that if we increase the ionic strength, this leads to a decrease in our mean activity coefficient. Okay, so let's just summarize the different effects of ionic strength on our mean activity coefficient and our concentration equilibrium constant. So let's just recall this relationship over here. The thermodynamic KSV is going to be equal to the term containing all the activity coefficients times the concentration solubility product constant. Okay, so let's look at the effect of ionic strength on our mean activity coefficient. Okay, so let's just highlight the ideal value over here. So the ideal value is equal to 1. Okay, so if we have a zero ionic strength, we expect that we have a super ideal solution, right? So our activity coefficient expected to be 1. Okay, but as we increase the ionic strength, we, see to, we expect to have significant deviations. Okay, so the usual curve for this is that we go downwards. Okay. So as we increase ionic strength, we tend to decrease the activity coefficient. So this means that this term over here also tends to decrease, okay? Always keep in mind, however, that the thermodynamic equilibrium constant remains constant, okay? So it's our Ksp prime, okay? So the concentration equilibrium constant, this is what varies with ionic strength, okay? So we expect that as our K gamma decreases, in order for this term to remain constant, our Ksp prime is expected to increase with increasing ionic strength, okay? So we could plot this over here, okay? So we have ionic strength on the x-axis and our Ksp prime up here. So again, our ideal case when we have zero ionic strength is when our Ksp prime is equal to our Ksp, okay? So we expect to have our plot start over here, but we expect that as we increase the ionic strength, we're going to be increasing our Ksp to compensate for the decrease in our K gamma, okay? So overall, our plot will go as follows, okay? So we have an increase in our Ksp prime, okay? So in this particular case, our Ksp prime, this corresponds to the concentration of silver ions and chloride ions, all divided by, of course, by their corresponding standard states, 
Okay, so this tells us that since we're increasing the Ksp prime, we get an increase in the concentration of silver ions and chloride ions in solution as we increase the ionic strength. Okay, so our equilibrium is consistently shifting forward as we increase our ionic strength. Okay, so this is explained by our Debye-Huckel theory of ionic solutions. Okay, so let's try to calculate a little bit of this using our next example over here. Okay, so in our example, we could we want to calculate the concentration of calcium ions in equilibrium with a saturated solution of calcium fluoride in A, water, and B, in, in a solution of 0.001 molar sodium chloride. Okay, so we're given the thermodynamic equilibrium constant for the, for the equilibrium process over here. So before we proceed for this particular problem, we'll be making a couple of assumptions. So one will be assuming that we have no other reactions occurring in our system aside from the one of interest. And we'll also make a couple of initial assumptions in order to solve for this problem. Okay, okay so when we're solving for A, okay, so when we dissolve calcium fluoride in water, okay, so the only ions in solution will result from the dissolution of our calcium fluoride. Okay, so this process is given by calcium 2 plus aqueous plus R, two fluoride ions aqueous, okay? So our KSP describes this process over here, okay? So we could also make a corresponding ice table, okay? So initially we have no calcium or fluoride ions in solution, okay? So our corresponding changes will be plus X plus 2X, and the corresponding equilibrium concentrations will be X and 2x. Okay, so our thermodynamic equilibrium constant is given by the activity of our calcium ions times the activity of our fluoride ions squared. Okay, so if we expand this to include our activity coefficients, okay, so this is going to be equal to, okay, so the activity coefficient of, of our calcium times the concentration of our calcium ion times the activity of our fluoride ion squared times the concentration of our fluoride ion. Okay, so overall Ksp, this is equal to, okay, so keep in mind that we could use the mean activity coefficient instead. So we have the mean activity coefficient raised to 3 times the concentration of calcium times the concentration of fluoride squared, okay? So note, of course, that we always have to divide this by the corresponding standard state, but we just omitted it for simplicity, okay? So this over here, this product, this is called your Ksp prime, okay? So Ksp, this is equal to mean activity coefficient raised to 3 times Ksp prime. So it's actually from Ksp prime where we could calculate the equilibrium concentration of our ions in solution, okay? So Ksp prime, this is just equal to our Ksp, our thermodynamic equilibrium constant given over here, divided by the mean activity coefficient raised to 3, okay? So overall, in order to calculate the concentration of calcium ions in solution, we need to figure out what the activity coefficient is. Okay, so we can determine the activity coefficient from the ionic strength of our solution. Okay, but in this particular case, the ionic strength of our solution is determined by the ions present in solution. Okay, so in this case, the only ions present in solution are our calcium ions and our fluoride ions, which are then determined by this over here. Okay, so it's kind of circular in nature. So that's why we need to make some initial assumptions. Okay, so the process is technically technically has to be iterative to get a better approximation of the answer, but we can just do this one for the sake of an initial approximation, okay? So our initial assumption, okay, so we're going to assume that Ksp prime is equal to Ksp, okay? So this will just allow us to calculate the approximate concentration of ions in solution from this process over here, okay? So overall, Ksp prime, this is equal to the concentration of calcium ions, so x, times the, cal times the concentration of fluoride ions, so it's 2x squared, okay? So this is 4x raised to 3, okay? So we're assuming that Ksp prime is equal to Ksp, so this is equal to 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11, so that means that x which is equal to our calcium ion concentration. This is equal to 
times 10 to the negative 4 molar and our concentration of fluoride ions this is equal to 4.27 times 10 to the negative 4 molar okay so these two values over here will allow us to get an initial ionic strength of our solution okay so let's move on to a fresh style okay so let's calculate the ionic strength of our solution okay so that is i is equal to one half times the concentration of calcium times its corresponding charge plus the concentration of fluoride ions times its corresponding charge okay so based on what we calculated earlier this is going to be equal to 2.14 times 10 to the negative 4 molar times plus 2 squared plus 4.27 times 10 to the negative 4 molar times negative 1 squared. Okay, so overall our ionic strength, this is equal to 6.42 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. Okay, so now that we know the ionic strength, we could then use this to calculate the mean activity coefficient okay so let's use the debye huckel limiting law okay so this is equal to log gamma plus or minus is equal to negative 0.509 times the absolute value of our charges okay so that's plus 2 times negative 1 times the square root of our ionic strength so that is 6.42 times 10 to the negative 4 molar okay so upon solving for our mean activity coefficient this is equal to 0.942 okay so we can see here that even though we just dissolved our salt in water we see that there's actually some deviation that we could observe from the presence of the ions in solution okay so now using this keeping this in mind we can now calculate for the real ksp prime so ksp prime this is equal to ksp over the mean activity coefficient raised to 3 so this is 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11 over 0 0.942 raised to 3 okay so our ksp prime when we take into account our ionic strength now is 4.666 times 10 to the negative 11 okay so using our earlier equation this is going to be equal to 4 times x raised to 3 okay where x this is equal to our calcium ion concentration in solution okay so upon solving for x we get 2.3 times 10 to the negative 4 molar okay so contrast this with our initial approximation when we neglected to take into account the ionic strength of our solution okay so it's actually right over here okay so initially if we don't take into account the ionic strength of our solution our initial guess for the concentration of calcium ion in solution is just 2.14 times 10 to the negative 4 molar okay but when we take into account the presence of these ions in solution we actually have an increase in solubility okay so it actually affects itself in order to become more soluble in solution so there really is an increase in the solubility of our ionic salt in solution so now let's see for what happens when we consider part B over here. Okay, so we'll be doing a very similar analysis to this case. So what's going to be different now is that we'll be changing the ionic strength of our solution. Okay, so let's just see how we could change the solubility of our calcium fluoride by adding sodium chloride in our solution. So let's just move on to a fresh slide over here. Okay, so for part B, We'll again assume initially that Ksp prime is equal to Ksb. So we have our concentration of calcium ions initially. So that is 2.14 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. And our fluoride ions as 4.27 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. Okay, so in our initial problem over here, these were the only ions in solution. For B, we now added some sodium ions and some chloride ions, okay? So the concentrations of these are going to be 0 0.001 molar, 0 0.001 molar, okay? So that means when we're 
calculating the ionic strength of our solution, we need to take into account all of these ions, okay? So initially we calculated the ionic strength of this to be 6.42 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. So all we need to do is to add the ionic strength of this solution here, okay? So we have 6.42 times 10 to the negative 4 molar plus one half of our sodium chloride solution, okay? So this is 0 0.001 molar times plus 1 squared plus 0 0.001 molar times negative 1 squared, okay? So our ionic strength, when we also include the sodium chloride solution, this is going to be 1.642 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. Okay, so we could use this new ionic strength in order to calculate for the mean activity coefficient. So again, using the de Bayhuckel limiting law, okay, so this is going to be log, the mean activity coefficient is equal to negative 0 0.509 times the absolute value of the charges times the square root of our ionic strength. Okay, so 1.642 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. Okay, so if we calculate the mean activity coefficient for part B, this is going to be 0.909. Okay, so again, using the same strategy, okay, so we want to calculate the updated KSP when we take into account this activity coefficient over here. So this is going to be KSP, so 3.9 times 10 to the negative 11 over the mean activity coefficient raised to 3. Okay, so this is equal to 5.19 times 10 to the negative 11. So if we equate this to 4x raised to 3, where x is a concentration of calcium ions, okay, we get 2.4 times 10 to the negative 4. Okay, so we can see here that as we added even more ions into our solution, as we increase ionic strength, we further increase the concentration of calcium ions in solution. Okay, so again, this suggests that this particular equilibrium over here shifted even more forward as we increase the ionic strength of our solution. All right, okay, so overall, we just discussed a case in which we might see some non-ideal behavior in our system. This is our first introduction into the application of activities as well as ionic strengths and mean activity coefficients for, for aqueous solutions, okay? So later on, once we start talking about electrochemistry, we'll also discuss how we could measure activities and also how we could determine experimentally the mean activity coefficients of ionic solids in aqueous solution, okay?